Carty, just before we get to our plan to show it, Tass will be going well. We're in the middle of a fun day in the spring trip, which is why we can get parked for a 16 mile radius. But we're here anyway, so grab me the wine of our plan as Chuck. Uh, we will be organising, we're going to a youth and community hub for if anybody who hasn't been here before. And organising talks such as this is very much part of what we do. We put a huge emphasis on critical thinking, political education, historical talks and stuff. And it's a good honour to be able to have Liam here today. I didn't know when I first contacted Liam, I says, Fargo McGonagall from, from Glorna Mona. Oh, Fargo, could you remember that, Cara? So he had Irish type, which, which I didn't know. So if anybody has any questions in Irish, we can also we can also host them. And the talk is on Facebook Live. So if anybody wants to interact online, and come up with a question that can. We've asked the highly esteemed Dr. Fergal McCluskey, Hannah Bay Mark Catterlack and Sean you to, to Fergal McCluskey and Mark Edger and blow in as far if we were meant to defeat the plane, Bunny Small. Uh, he is originally from Dungannon. He's a highly esteemed, a highly esteemed Irish historian who won't be employed by any university because he's a socialist Republican who tells the truth. That's why we have him as the head of history at College of Barstow. He's also a lecturer at St Mary's College. He's published widely on Irish history and he's going to give a short context and he's going to be my Carol Evan Lane. So, Bill, what's the Fergal? What's the name? Thank you very much for watching us in our sea. We are being the third on the solar hushy and much in that room. We all the football, the lad, the best, all the salad for the weekend. Me and my football, Martin. Uh, so, the way long I get to know the name, I got an idea that you can draw the name She nor Stari, Stadja and Janta, I get her over to the near Naya, August, but the Shell on the near Freshman, I go well, Shell, Kiga, the name catch it, I get a Lush of the Garden, oh yeah, so it's more an honour to win you a new. Well, Liam and Charles and you, because you've got a wrench and say, you wish you could have a couple of jigs in me. Can you Charles or Emma Harvey Tawata, a gold tax that I've read in Yerden, a hard and easy from the day? I guess possibly he knows me, Sean, I guess it would be Tommy Ra, so to Isabelle, see, and the Bupa on the building. So I'm going to just give a wee bit of English as well. Okay, so Falche, welcome to BMNU. Uh, the power that the mix will be in is that it happens during a uh, period of intense uh, activism by trade unionists and socialists across Ireland in the perhaps the year leading up to the armistice and for a year and a half after the armistice until the downturn in economic conditions and the onset of what's happening there. When working class people sort of working class people I mean, whenever the, the ruling class kind of treated these things like crimes and to commit a crime what CSA you need three things. Okay? You need a uh, motive, we always have the motive, but you need the opportunity and the means. And for a very, very brief window in Irish history, at the end of the First World War, the working Irish working class had the opportunity and the means. They always had the motive, they were always oppressed and they were always the wretched of the earth. But for this brief period they stood up and they tried they demanded a, a different country, they demanded in the language of the time a cooperative Commonwealth or a Workers Republic. And then because perhaps the, the, the greatest example of this, but at the same time, or almost contemporaneous to Limerick, there were 60,000 people out on strike here in Belfast, the Bale Engineers strike. And at the same time, in Belfast, actually, I'll be talking, I'll give you a talk from the talk tomorrow. At eh, the same time in Belfast, eh, anti partitionist socialists, we wouldn't call them socialist Republicans, but members of the Belfast Labour Party were able to garner one fifth of the Protestant vote in places like the Shanka and across working class Protestant districts in Belfast. One fifth uh, of the electorate were content to vote for uh, socialist candidates from the Belfast Labour Party like Sam Cave and Dawson Gordon and Bob McLuhan and Campbell and these guys that went into the Belfast Labour Party. And it sort of exploded the myth really that you know there was this big Protestant monolith and who were these Protestant workers who were voting for these come in socialists they were the Middle East, they were the unskilled workers, and the people who didn't fit the myth of Protestant superiority. So across Ireland in this period, we see a massive upswell <coughs> in trade union activism, and despite what an awful lot of revisionist historians might want to tell you, I think there were revolutionary conditions, and I'm sure Dean's going to go in and talk about the strength of the, the mix of perhaps on the reason why, you know, some
something like that didn't happen on a far wider scale. So I want to the 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 Tory Gee Bull was all war that he insulted us in a near dog and kind of a fake new episode of money to turn up here and ask as a family catch the money made. Come here, Margaret Fergal, and again, though she's just the wine of her own. Good girl, she plunder her McCree, the Hanshaw, and you're her bit of Persia. Ah, it's more and more of the Hanshaw, eh, in Lord of Mona. Eh, Archie Will, on Gaelica, Arcus, eh, Cultur na Gaelica, eh, Freva, called Down Shin, Anish, Emas, Namina, Estina, the Kung, eh, on Rode Shin, her father. I thought I am a bit for the start to enter with. I guess Tom, our term shape, print shape, London, or maybe I guess Tom Morta sort of got got took a clear from chat and showing you the large free print over so that when we I I want to say that um, this morning uh, I had the, the privilege of getting a a mini two very interesting insights which kind of prepared me a little bit in my mind for, for chatting to you today about the Limerick Soviet. One was a, a brief tour uh, with Joe Austin, where we looked at, you know, the names will resonate with you. We looked at Divis Flats, we looked at St. Clonville School, we looked at Bombay Street, and we looked at Clonard Monastery as well, and we walked around that area. And, you know, we, we saw there, if you like, the, the, the crucible in which uh, the original troubles began. But interestingly enough, through Clonard and through the work of Father Reed, also the area out of which the first moves towards, towards peace and towards a peace process came. And then I had uh, the immensely enjoyable time uh, with Shane Awash in R.C. Canada. And uh, for me, because so much of what I'm going to chat to you about today commonly runs through it. Um, it was just interesting to see how beautifully Oracy Canila has been put together, how well the whole story of Connolly is told, and how it actually brings out a dimension of Connolly and Connolly's work, which you might think Limerick was a forgotten revolution, but which is largely overlooked I'm not sure if, you, if I would say it's forgotten, but it's certainly overlooked in the South, and that is Connolly's deep involvement and connection with Belfast as well. Uh, and it's wonderful to see the library there, to see the artworks, to see the, the work by Robert Ballock of the GPO, um, the other wonderful paintings of Connolly and so on. And so what you have there, and I'm looking forward to going back again uh, when I have more time to Orsi Canila, is, is a very as I wrote in the visitors' book, a very, very inspiring place uh, about about our history and about this particular man. And as I see, as I, I hope you can see, as I, I chat here, this very distinctive contribution that he made to Ireland and, and to the Irish people. So, the the title of what I wanted to talk to you about today, I've called it "Forgotten Revolution: The Limerick Soviet, 1919." 100 years on, lessons and legacies. From an early stage, when I got involved uh, in, in, in writing my book, the, the, the centenary edition of, of my book, I felt a responsibility to the women and men of the Limerick Soviet to tell their story as fully and fairly as possible. But as I came towards the end of the project, I became conscious that what I was actually wrestling with was a pioneering and innovative framework for analysing and understanding the forces at work and what really happened in Ireland from the aftermath of the Easter Rising of 1916 up to the end of the Civil War in 1923. And the more closely I researched events at regional or local level, the more I realised or I formed the view that there was a kind of a tapestry of competing and occasionally cooperating forces that sometimes operated in parallel and sometimes overlapped with each other but continuously jostled with each other
for a leadership position during those formative years. And I would identify those strands, uh, distinguish them, not in any particular order or hierarchy, as Sinn Féin, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the Irish Volunteers, the Catholic Bishops and their middle class adherents in farming and business, and the rural and urban workers, increasingly class conscious and organising into trade unions, especially the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, one of the forerunners of, of SIPTU. At the time, and I want to thank um, Fergal for his, his, his introductory remarks uh, for me as well, as he has uh, mentioned to you, internationally, Europe and the world was going through a convulsion of change and crises that were having or eventually would have a significant effect in Ireland. Some of them you're familiar with, the Great War, as he mentioned, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia in October 1917, the collapse of entire empires, the Russian, Ottoman, German, Austro-Hungarian, uh, and the French and British empires beginning to show fissures of discontent and a passion for independence in the Middle East, Egypt, India, and other colonial possessions. The new emerging world power was the United States, spurred on by the Democrat, the American president, President Wilson. The post-war Paris Peace Conference emphasized self-determination for subject nations and states of the defeated empires, and 20 new independent states were created across Europe in those years immediately after 1918. So, from October 1917 onwards, what I would call a red wave of revolution, Soviets, strikes, factory seizures, swept across the defeated countries from east to west, all the way to Belfast and Glasgow, as Fergal mentioned, in early 1919, when there were lengthy general strikes demanding a shorter working week. And as elsewhere in Europe, these were met by military and police repression. And millions of demobbed soldiers were returning home to unemployment and a pandemic of Spanish flu that was killing millions of people. So that was that big, broad European and world background. And if we look at what was happening in Ireland from September 1916, up to April 1919, when the Limerick Soviet took place, we can pick out a few important milestones. 1917, the return home of thousands of internees and prisoners, hardened by their experience under fire in 1916, and tempered in what were effectively universities of revolution, like Frongoch, Lewis, and Lincoln Jail. 1917-18 as well, the reorganisation of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, what the Easter Proclamation described as Ireland's secret military organisation under Michael Collins. Also in that same period, 1917-18, the reorganisation, recruitment and formation of units of the Irish Volunteers, spearheaded by IRB organisers who had proved themselves during the Easter Rising, and the formation of a volunteer's general headquarters, which was totally dominated by the Irish Republican Brotherhood. And the Brotherhood were determined not to, mis not to repeat their mistake at the foundation of the volunteers, when in order to maximize recruitment, they allowed prominent and respectable members of organizations like the Gaelic League and the GAA to take the most powerful positions, and this led to the situation at Easter 1916, when the nominal Chief of Staff of the Volunteers, Owen McNeil, tried to countermand the IRB-planned Easter Rising. 1917 also saw the reorganisation of Sinn Féin as a political force, with separation from Britain as its objective, culminating with a series of stunning by-election victories. And in passing, I would say that one of the confusing things uh, that historians have done, that teachers of history have done, that activists have done, is to use, when they're talking about this period, interchangeably, 
the terms like Sinn Feiners, volunteers, IRA. I, at this stage, prefer to use the term separatists because they, what they were agreed on was separation from Britain. But the actual format of what the separated country or state would look like was not agreed among them. And there was not agreement among them either as to whether the means to achieve that would be peaceful or militant. So I divide them into what I call peaceful separatists and militant separatists. Following the executions of 1916 and the death of Thomas Ashe in 1917 from forcible feeding while on hunger strike, there was the alienation of many of the Catholic bishops and clergy from the Irish Parliamentary Party and their move towards, if, if not supporting, then at least tolerating Sinn Féin. And finally, and most importantly, there was this huge expansion in trade union membership spearheaded by Connolly's Union, the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, and involving tens of thousands of unskilled workers, not least in rural areas. To the point where, in, in terms of the monitoring which was done by the Royal Irish Constabulary of organisations uh, that needed to be watched in the country, and there was a, a monthly report on these to Dublin Castle, the Irish Transport and General Workers Union is listed in there with Sinn Féin and with the volunteers as a, an organisation to be watched and was seen as every bit as much of a threat to British rule in Ireland as those other organisations. And cooperation between these diverse organisations reached a peak in the victory over the threat to in introduce conscription in April 1918, where the decisive factor in defeating it was the general strike by the trade unions. And this was decisively followed up in the stunning Sinn Féin sweep outside of North East Ulster in the December 1918 general election. There was cooperation between Labour and the separatists in devising the democratic programme of the First Oil and in seeking to gain recognition for Ireland in the international conferences that followed the ending of World War I. A notable success in this project was the separate seating of Ireland at the International Socialist Conference in Bern early in 1919. So, given you the European, the world picture, I've traced the, the elements, the forces that were working coming forward in that period from 1916. And that brings us to the beginning of the year 1919, when the first oil had met in public, and what I call the pacifist, non-IRB element of separatism, the main leader of which would have been Eamon de Valera, was focused on using the Doyle's moral and political mandate to gain international recognition for Ireland's cause, mainly by leveraging Irish-American pressure on President Wilson at the Paris Peace Conference. And at the same time, the military, or militant IRB element of separatism, led by Michael Collins, were gathering intelligence, munitions, and weapons with the intention of an early resumption of the armed struggle begun in 1916. And all of those forces and trends that I have identified at national level were exactly paralleled in Limerick and later fused together to create the conditions for a general strike that quickly morphed into a workers' council or Soviet in April 1919. Elements of those trends existed in other cities, towns and counties to a greater or lesser extent, but nowhere did they combine and coalesce with such force as in Limerick, due to a number of fortuitous local circumstances. Limerick, just to recap, for example, experienced the return of prisoners and internees. Limerick also had a Sinn Féin volunteer revival, but this time, crucial difference, it was under the leadership and control of hardened Irish Republican Brotherhood veterans sent down from Dublin, veterans of Easter week. The Catholic Bishop of Limerick, Dr. O'Dwyer, had written a famous pamphlet 
condemning the 1916 executions. And his successor at the time of the Soviet, Dr. Hallinan, was well disposed towards Sinn Féin, so long as they eschewed violence and oath-bound organisations. But his neighbour in Clare, Dr. Fogarty, could best be described as an out-and-out -out Republican. Labour elected a Sinn Féin TD to the first oil, and in 1918, the city had its first Sinn Féin mayor. More significantly, in a way, perhaps, was the arrival of the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union in 1917, which saw thousands of unskilled women and men recruited into the union. And Limerick City and Council, County began to experience a tsunami of worker militancy that was unequaled anywhere else. <coughs> now, much of this activity was due to the work of a committed Marxist and socialist union organiser named John Dowling. He had been a comrade of James Connolly in the Irish Socialist Republican Party, as well as in the Union. And in the week before the GPO, he had pleaded with Connolly to allow, allow him to join him in the GPO. But, and I sometimes think that this was Connolly with an eye to future struggles, ordered Dowling his words were, get down to the Galtees and organise workers into the union. And Dowling more than took him at his word. And I, I think that what was at the back of Connolly's mind there was a feeling that he didn't want all the good men and women to be lost in the GPO, that there were others who would have to stay after the GPO and carry on the struggle that he had begun. And there were two upsurges of grassroots militancy but of radically different forms in the early part of 1919 that accelerated the pace of events nationally. One was the ambush and killing of two policemen at Sullivan Bay in County Tipperary, and the other, a few months later, was the Limerick general strike against British militarism, more often known as the Limerick Soviet. In Limerick, those strands of thinking that I've identified converged in the life and work and the violent death of a young man named Robert Byrne. He was chairman of the local post office clerks association. He was a delegate to the Limerick United Trades and Labour Council. He was a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood and in fact only today I passed by that mural which marks Sean McDermott's visit to Belfast uh, in, in, in the years before the Rising. Robert Byrne's home in Limerick was visited before the Rising by both Thomas Clark and by Sean McDermott. And it is clear, they were under police observation, but it is clear that it was part of the preparation of Limerick as a central staging point in the passage of arms from Bannistrand up through County Clare and on into East Galway and perhaps onto, onto Dublin as well. So he was deeply involved and deeply familiar with the leadership of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. And with the rank of captain, <coughs> he was adjutant of the IRB dominated 2nd Battalion of the Irish Volunteers, Mid Limerick Brigade. And Robert Curran's violent death was the catalyst that produced a spontaneous reaction from each of these diverse strands. The ITGW and other trade unions, the IRB, Irish Volunteers, Sinn Féin, as well as respectable Catholic Limerick <coughs> that resulted in the general strike and the Soviet. The new <coughs> centenary edition of Forgotten Revolution, which is on the, the, the table down there, uh, gives a detailed account of the Soviet far more detail than was in the, the earlier version of the book. It also covers more the years leading into it, which I've sketched out for you, and the years afterwards. Uh, and it's there, it's available for anybody who wants to buy it afterwards uh, at, at, at 10 pounds. Uh, so rather than going into great detail here, I'll just give a general outline before I refer to the main narrative uh, or contention that I want to put before you this afternoon. In February 1919, 
Robert Byrne was court-martialed and jailed for possession of a revolver and ammunition. He led Republican prisoners in Limerick in a protest to get treatment as political prisoners. In other words, that they would have wear their own clothes, each would have their own individual cell, and a very interesting aspect of being uh, treated in that way would be that they would have the ability to continue to practice their trades while in prison, so that if you were a tailor, you could get uh, material sent into jail to make a suit for somebody, or you could fix somebody's shoes, or whatever. And after a punishment diet of bread and water, followed by some weeks of a hunger strike, Robert Byrne was transferred to a local hospital. And there, on the 6th of April, the IRA, IRB, mounted essentially a botched rescue attempt. A policeman was killed, another was seriously wounded, and Robert Byrne was fatally wounded, probably by a member of the rescue party, though the grapevine at the time said that it was a police boat. And more than 10,000 women and men, many of them in volunteer and coming along uniform, marched behind his coffin to his graveside, where a volley of shots was fired. Now, already spooked by the public meeting of the First Dáil and the killings at Salahed Bay, the British authorities, to a degree in panic, responded to these latest killings by declaring Limerick, Limerick City, a special military area. And that was done under the terms of what was called the Defence of the Realm Act, which allowed them to cut off entire areas of cities, uh, for, to, to, uh, basically to protect them from German spies during the war. And the city was surrounded by barbed wire barricades, and the bridges across the Shannon were blocked by barriers and tanks. And if you had designed a form of special military area to cause, to provoke the workers of Limerick, you couldn't have done it better than what the British did, because the border of the military area ran through the middle of the River Shannon, the middle of the bridges, which meant that the whole populous working class area of Thomond Gate, which included several big employers, several very important factories, was outside of the, of the military area. And the point was that if you were to go across those bridges to and from your work every day, you had to produce a military pass and you had to be checked four times a day going to and from your work. And of course the objective of that was to drive people down to the British military headquarters so that they would be vetted by the Royal Irish Constabulary and you would only get a pass to go to work if the Royal Irish Constabulary were satisfied that you weren't a Republican, you weren't a member of the volunteers, and that you were sound and safe uh, from a loyal point of view. And it was partly to try and, if you like, squeeze uh, the, 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 the volunteers out of the community. 600 women workers employed in Cleves Condensed Milk Factory, members of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, decided to strike against these restrictions. The following day, Limerick Trades Council declared a general strike from the 14th of April, 1919, and 14,000 workers responded. On that first day, they realized that the city's fate was in their hands. And with that came the basic responsibility of ensuring that the citizens were fed. So, on that very first day, they ordered the bakers to fire up the ovens, the dockers to unload grain from vessels in, in, in the port, the millers to grind flour, and from the first Tuesday morning onwards, there was a basic supply of food. And at, after that first day, the Irish Times newspaper sarcastically described the council as a Soviet, but they embraced the term with enthusiasm. They controlled prices, the opening hours of shops, cart and transporting of goods within the city. They published their own newspaper, the Workers' Bulletin, and in, a, in an amazing, unique development, anywhere in the world, they, when they began to run out of money, they printed their own currency. And they promised shopkeepers that if you take this currency and sell bread or sell butter uh, and take this currency from, it, from us, at the end 
of this strike, when it is over, we will honour those promissory notes and you will be paid out of the funds gathered. And every contemporary newspaper comments favourably on how efficiently everything was run. And by a happy coincidence, the Soviet achieved worldwide newspaper and newsreel headlines. Many overseas journalists had gathered in Limerick to report on an attempt to fly the Atlantic from east to west for a big prize that was put up by one of the British newspapers. And when that story flopped, because the plane flopped literally into the Irish Sea, they turned their attention to the stirring events happening in the city. Now, and this was something I didn't know when I wrote the book in 1989. I now know it and it's in the centenary edition and the story is developed in the centenary edition. A critical factor in the initial success was that at the outset, the strike committee co-opted to membership a man called Commandant Michael Brennan, who was officer commanding the East Clare Brigade of the Irish Volunteers and was a senior member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. And Brennan put the Clare and Limerick network of the IRB, the Volunteers and Sinn Féin to work in maintaining clandestine food supplies to the city. And when I wrote the original version of that book in 1989, it puzzled me. I didn't have an explanation as to why farmers, who normally would not be seen as easy companions or bedfellows of trade unions, were so willing to supply Limerick with food. But we found out the explanation when the new archives and annals opened that it was Michael Brennan and the IRB who organised that. Initially, the strikers had the tacit support of the Catholic bishops in Limerick and Clare and their clergy, as well as the enthusiastic support of the mainly Sinn Féin small business owners and artisans, and the mute compliance of the mainly unionist big business owners. And after a week, the strike leaders knew that Limerick had a choice. It either had to escalate nationally or perish. And initially, the treasurer of the Irish Labour Party and Trade Union Congress, Thomas Johnson, when he arrived in Limerick, seemed to promise national support. And Johnson, I'll just say this in brackets, when you look back at him, he had a strong connection, of course, with Belfast, but he was a past master at a phenomenon that was there to some extent uh, among certain trade union leaders at the time, that he, he talked very radical talk, but he didn't deliver on it. So he arrives to Limerick saying there will be national support, all Ireland is at your back, and so on. But this is why I go back to those forces that I described at the start. Once the Soviet sought a national escalation, this uneasy coalition that had been supporting them at local level began to crumble. The national trade union leadership was not prepared to countenance a general strike, partly because of opposition from loyalist elements in Belfast and from British headquartered trade unions, mainly the National Union of Rail Workers, and partly because they felt they did not have the means to defend workers if the military retaliated. The cabinet of the first Dáil discussed Limerick three times and their representatives spent three days in discussions with the leadership of the Trade Union Congress. Doyle ministers like de Valera, who favoured this gradual, peaceful approach to separatism, were not prepared to support a militant struggle, least of all one that was led by workers. And the upshot of the contact was agreement on a plan with support from the more militant IRB ministers, notably Richard Mulcahy and Michael Collins, to evacuate Limerick and leave it as an empty shell in the hands of the military as a, as a means of protest which would draw further worldwide attention. And this was a version of a tactic that had been devised but never implemented to oppose conscription in 1918 and it was rejected out of hand 
by the uh, Workers' Council in Limerick as being totally impractical. Locally, the British authorities sat tight and let events take their course. The workers rejected the evacuation plan out of hand, as I said. But alarmed by the turn of events, the Bishop and the Sinn Féin Mayor, representing, you could say, the devout and the middle class of the city, turned against the Soviet and lobbied hard for it to end. There was a partial resumption of work after 10 days and a full resumption after 14. But the Limerick Soviet had a major effect on events in the succeeding months and years. The competing strands in the uneasy alliance that produced it each began to pursue their own path towards separatism, towards separation and independence, and increasingly came into conflict with each other. The political wing of separatism continued their search for international and American pressure on, on Britain, and de Valera went to America for a long period of time to rally support and funds. The military wing stepped up the tempo of assassinations of members of the Royal Irish Constabulary, attacks on barracks in pursuit of weapons and ammunition, and eventually developed this into guerrilla warfare and into the flying columns, spearheaded by the flying columns. And Collins, of course, also honed his intelligence network, and by 1920, the work had begun of establishing alternative systems of local government and courts under the first Dáil era. The two wings of separatism continued on these distinct paths until the Anglo-Irish Treaty of December 1921 forced them at last to confront their underlying differences. And one view is that the IRB under Collins saw it as a stepping stone, a breather before renewing the struggle for full independence, while de Valera and others, the Cottle Brewer, saw it as preferring to continue a struggle towards a republic, which existed not mythically but in reality and had been declared in 1916. The British took lessons from Limerick as well. In the face of peaceful mass civil disobedience by 14,000 workers, thousands of troops, no matter how well armed and supported by tanks, armoured cars and barbed wire, were of little value in, report, in restoring public order because they could not afford to have another Amritsar massacre, which had occurred in India only about a week before the Soviet began. They could not afford to have a massacre like that in these islands in the full scrutiny of international newspapers and newsreads. There was an, an episode happened on Easter Sunday uh, in 1919 where about a thousand young men and women went out of Limerick uh, across the bridge to a place called Cahar Davin where they had uh, a hurling match, a football match, they had an airy and an open air KD and so on. And then at seven o'clock in the evening, they sought to get back into the city. And they did a, a very interesting thing. There was about a thousand of them, and each one of them individually came up to the soldier and asked to be allowed back. And when they were refused, they went back to the end of the queue and they started all over again. And that was, that was a very interesting and very clever because what the British would have preferred would have been if a couple of hundred of them had rushed the troops on the bridge and they could have used force against them. And they stayed overnight uh, on the clear side of the river. They were looked after by the people. They had an all-night KD. They had rashers, bread, butter, milk, butter, eggs, everything brought into them by the clear farmers. And the following day, basically, they hijacked a goods train and crossed the river back into Limerick by the railway bridge and broke through the corridor in that way. Because many of the, the troops in Limerick were working class Welsh and Scots young men, and they were less than rigorous in policing the military uh, restrictions. While a thousand went out on that Easter Sunday, it was about two or three hundred came back on the train, the reason being that the other several hundred were allowed back quietly through the barricades under cover of darkness by the rank and file British Tommies. <coughs> the other important aspect from the British point of view was 
that Limerick confirmed the tacit support for separatism, let's use that word for the moment, had grown enormously among the Catholic middle and farming classes to the point where they were prepared to provide cover for IRA or Irish volunteer activities. And in the face of these factors and the rising toll of police deaths as 1919 continued, their conclusion was that harder and tougher forces were needed, men prepared to kill or be killed and ignore regulations and law if that was what the task required, and that was the auxiliaries and the black and tans. The workers and their socialist organisers were emboldened by Limerick and continued on their militant path. Within a fortnight of the Soviet ending, the socialist organisers and members of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union were involved in Soviets and strikes in Cleves's creameries and mills in counties Limerick and Tipperary under the red flag and the tricolour and under slogans like, we make bread, not profits. The renewed industrial struggles continued throughout the rest of 1919 and in all there were 37 strikes and lockouts in Limerick that year, twice as many as in the previous year. And it's estimated that ultimately there were hundreds of Soviet seizures and occupations mainly across the province of Munster in the aftermath of Limerick and in the years that followed. In 1920, for example, in the west of Ireland, there was a wave of agitation for the breaking up of estates and big farms. And the Republican Department of Home Affairs, the minister at that time, was Countess Markovich. She wrote that she saw them as a grave danger threatening the foundations of the Republic. So the Sinn Féin courts and the IRA police were used to put down these uprisings. The land seizures were paralleled by farm strikes and a farmer's freedom force was formed to take such action as was required to be a national bulwark against labour, socialism and Bolshevism. April 1920 also saw a general strike in support of Republican hunger strikers and the rank and file of the trade unions quickly took control of that strike. There were seizures, I mean there's a long list, I won't go through them all, there were seizures, takeovers, Soviets, red flags, in places that are almost impossible to conceive of today. Kilkenny, Cavan, Galway, Chul, Castlebar, Ballina, other towns in Galway and Mayo. The list goes on, it includes places like Derry, Carrick on Shannon, Longford, Navan, Sligo, Nina, Clonmel. I won't even continue the list, you get the picture. 1921, the year of the truce and the treaty, saw a huge economic downturn. Manufacturing output halved, agricultural prices were slashed, and one in four workers were unemployed. By the end of that year, Ireland was engulfed in another major strike wave and, a work and an outbreak of workplace Soviets. Across much of the country, farm labourers were on strike, blocking roads, felling trees, and with creameries refusing to process milk. And once again, the farmers were backed very often by local IRA units in trying to break the strike. At the same time, workers were occupying creameries throughout Limerick, Tipperary, North Cork and West Walford, what are now called the Munster Soviets. The farmers responded with violence against the strikers, who answered with rallies, protests and more red flags. So by the time we get to 1922, the Irish Free State was firmly ensconced and they used the army and police to break up a strike by 10,000 post office workers. And the last throes of this wave of militancy that began in Limerick in April 1919 was a Waterford Gasworks Soviet early in 1923 and a huge Waterford farm labourer strike in May 1923. And the Free State Special Infantry Corps were deployed to hold the county in its grip and the farmers formed what they called White Guards, which were modelled on the forces which had uh, opposed the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. The union organiser, James Baird, proposed widespread occupation of factories and farms to support the strikers, but instead 
the General Secretary of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, William O'Brien, stepped in, stopped their strike pay, and the strike was enjoyed no more than a partial success. And it was at that point that O'Brien, who had been very close to Connolly, who was a disciple of Connolly, who saw himself as the, the jealous guardian of Connolly's legacy, finally decided that what, what was meant by Connolly's legacy was not his thoughts and his teachings and his ideas uh, in relation to revolution, but was the physical structure and the organization of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union. And he put preservation of that over and above the, the achievement or working towards the achievement of Connolly's teachings. Now, it strikes me that the range, the duration, and the violence that was involved in these struggles would suggest that what we are really looking at is a second class-based civil war. cities were all put down by either the British military, the IRA, free state troops, or anti-treaty irregulars, depending on when and where they happened, and on which side was prevailing at that stage, either in the War of Independence or the Civil War. And in an echo of how Limerick ended and was abandoned by outside forces, the later Soviets were also opposed at every step by a curious coalition of timid national trade union leaders and Catholic bishops. <coughs> so, when we come to the end of that uh, four years from 1919 to 1923, the five major national trends or forces that I identified at national level and then at Limerick level, and that, that had cooperated with each other to varying extents after 1916, they had achieved varying levels of success. The pacifist separatists and the military separatists had achieved a degree of separation from Britain for a part of the island. The Catholic middle class business people and large farmers entered into an economic environment in the south that accorded and served their class interests. The Catholic bishops, clergy and religious became the arbiters and controllers of morality in the new free state. So they all got something out of what had been going on. The national trade union leaders in the south were content to bide their time and preside over a diminished and weakened trade union movement that did not begin to revive until the 1930s. But for the rural and urban workers and their militant socialist organizers, the path that they embarked on after Limerick proved to be a dead end. Of all of the groups, they did not achieve any of their economic or political aims. In fact, their position went into reverse. Their wages were slashed, there was high unemployment, and there was heavy emigration. This happened partly because of the superior strength of the forces ranged against them, but also because, unlike 1913 or 1916, they no longer had a forceful citizens' army or workers' defence army of their own for the better, better off-classes. And in addition, given that I was this morning in Odyssey Canila, uh, I said it there and I'll say it here again, <coughs> they were hamstrung by excessive adherence to Connolly's philosophy of syndicalism, which was a version of socialism that he, I suppose you could say, learned in the United States, but that favoured industrial action, the general strike by one big union over politics as the best way to affect revolutionary change. So from a position <clears throat> all the way through 1917, 1918, up to early 1919, uh, of partnership with Sinn Féin and the separatists, official labor abandoned rank and file militancy and was relegated to a subsidiary role in the struggle for independence. The gun had prevailed over the placard. So if I turn briefly just to some of the lessons and legacies. The first one 
might seem a bit obvious, but I think it's necessary to say it. The first lesson is that there was a general strike against British militarism, the Limerick Soviet of April 1919, and it was of long-term national significance. And I think it is time to move on from what has been there for a long time, even in the labour and the trade union movement, and among a small coterie of historians, those who even bother to devote a paragraph or two to the Limerick Soviet in their books, a kind of a patronizing view of the Soviet as an exotic regional aberration in the ultra-Catholic confraternity city of Limerick. Instead of seeing it for what I think it is, a vital determining factor or milestone in the evolution of the War of Independence. It was a moment when rank and file militancy pushed organized women and men in trade unions to the forefront, only to see that position lost through Republican rivalry, internal tensions, and an absence of the necessary will and means. And in the new version of Forgotten Revolution, I hope that I have laid the foundation for the beginning of a necessary reappraisal and reevaluation of the importance and the role of the Soviet in those years, 1919 to 23. The other lessons are maybe more obvious now than they were to the participants in the maelstrom of events in Ireland 100 years ago. One lesson might be the truth of the Shannokal ni Narth Bukhara Unskilled and skilled workers were united in the Soviet, and it showed what was attainable when sectional differences were put to one side and there was a united focus on a single major issue, which was the right to freely go to and from their work without let or hindrance or permission for anybody. By today's standards, they were an unsophisticated, not formally educated people, yet their organisational achievements were mighty. They fed an entire city for a fortnight. They achieved international media coverage. They printed their own newspaper. They had their own currency. They organised the city for, for two to three weeks. They planned, they organised, they remained focused. But as I said, they were held back by their exclusive emphasis on industrial means instead of supplementing it with political means. Which meant that when the issue of escalating Limerick reached the first Dáil cabinet to discuss it, there was nobody seated within the first Dáil cabinet who was able to articulate a specific socialist or trade union point of view which would have advocated the kind of support that they were looking for. The role of organised women and men workers but in particular, their role in the initial phases of the struggle for independence. And then, in the following years, their own distinctive struggle to achieve Connolly's Workers' Republic. That role has been forgotten, neglected, and even suppressed by academics, by journalists, and by politicians. And you've all heard the old cliche about the victors writing history. But for us, maybe a better analysis is to say that history is just politics conducted by other means. And that explains why this history was suppressed and why it needs to be brought forward again into contemporary debate. Because who and what we remember and celebrate is an indication of where our current politics are trending and what we support. In the South, the government supported decade of centenaries has done a lot to recover the distinctive role of women and come them on. But what are the prospects of something similar being done for the women and men who organized into trade unions led a distinctive and autonomous strand of the struggle? This is an objective that Republicans of today should welcome and support, even though, as this talk and as parts of the book has shown, the record their record on social issues at that time is a mixed one. But I think we need to face up to the totality of events of 1916 to 23 and accept that at some times, some of our heroes and heroines, under pressure of events, 
at feet of clay. Personally, at this stage, I'm going to continue to fight for it, but I have no great hope that this work will be done by academics or mainstream media. And it's given great hope, I have to say, by what I saw in Odyssey Camilla today, the way they're the way they're telling the story in a, in a compelling way for everybody to understand. Thankfully, the digitization of archives has freed history from the dusty shackles of libraries, files, and archives. But to really free it and to get to the story of workers, workers, the story of the workers' part in the struggle will not be found in the military archives in Carl Brewer Barracks in Dublin or in university libraries. That will require painstaking research in the pages of the scores of local newspapers at the time. And for that, you need volunteers and activists who see this work as a necessary support for mainstream political activity. Digitization, online, social media, 24 seven access, has given us user-friendly, vivid ways to access history to react to it and to spread its message. Remembrance and, so I saw this today in Odyssey Camilla, remembrance and commemoration and teaching can now be done powerfully through imaginative use of reenactments, drama, film, video, documentaries, oral histories, storytelling, YouTube, Instagram, you name it. There will always be a respected place for memorials for reeds, for flags, and for pipers. But for, particularly for the younger people coming up, we really need to look seriously at supplementing that by these new and accessible media and forms of communication. Good evening, my way.
They were of the people who are going to tell you, no, it's okay, we believe in the Socialist Republic and the Voters Republic and the Cooperative Commonwealth, but we'll get this wee bit of work done here first with the EU and the boys, and then we'll sort it all out. Because the, the, the lesson of Irish history are that unless working class people demand significant social change, unless they, they are not very dedicated to stand together, and unless they create the template, they move the overturned window, unless they move the window of debate, the, what type of United Ireland is there going to be? This has to be a United Ireland, it be the type of United Ireland the Old Republic of Colony called for. And if we don't stand now and make our case now and pr project that now, it's not going to happen. We get soft soap with, you know, nice commemorative events and nice words, but it won't happen. It's not going to happen unless the people who are going to be the main beneficiaries, that's the majority of the people here in Ireland, North and South, stand up and demand it now. So that's what, the, what, what I do from your talk anyway, Liam, but I'm sure there are other people have other things to add. So, has anybody got any questions or? Just to ask a question on that exact point that you made, but was it, I, I should have mentioned at the start that the reason, one of the, the reasons why that we asked Ian to come up, I say from the fact that I think this period of history is very interesting and stimulating, when we do historical events in here, it's, it's to try and, I suppose, take the emancipatory element of that history, the deliberatory element of that history, and reframe it, and regurgitate it, and reuse it in here and now. Because if we're just going to look at historiography, for nostalgia and commemorative reasons, then we as an organisation have no interest in that at all. It's about trying, as I said, to take that history and, and try and, and reshape it and reframe it in the here and the now. And that's a big, there's something like I counted this morning, there's 27 different debates on the United Ireland during the programme here. There's hundreds of events on, 27 different talks on the United Ireland. And this is this one that's focused specifically on, on, on what was forgotten in the earlier revolution. Period. And for us, it's about trying to take this debate and put it into the, the exact discussion that Fergal talked about. What type of Ireland, what type of society do we want? And, and Labour can't wait. Labour battle market won't wait. Can't wait. We've been through too, too, too much, we've had too much struggle to go through another another betrayal of, the, of this kind. So what has to happen is, in our view, this debate needs to be opened out. So in, in your view, how can we take that history and use it for the debate that, that's on our part of our steps? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big question. Um, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm very conscious um, uh, listening to Fergal that I, I'm seated on the same bench as um, a teacher, an academic, who is very much an exception to what I would say in general in relation to academics. And I, I, would, I would come to your point in a second. But I, I first took an interest learned about the Limerick Soviet back in 1969, halfway through the, the century, right? And I, I, I started taking an interest in it because I was involved in politics at the time. Um, we were being told socialism is alien. It's not part of the Irish way of life. Um, don't want anything to do it, with it. And I wanted to try and show people that, as I put it, that their grandmothers and their grand great-grandmothers were far more radical in their time than the people that we were dealing with at that particular time, right? And just very briefly, I'm, I'm, I'm probably a little bit more dubious and doubtful now about the, the state of studying all of this than it would have been 30 or 40 years ago. The um, Irish Labour History Society set up in 1974, and there was a Bit of an, it did bring about a bit of a revival in some of the university faculties in, um, in, in researching aspects of labour history and so on. But I think what's happening now uh, over the last few years um, in, in our universities and, and third level, it seems to me, you know, you know Fergal may correct me on this, that the, what is going on at the moment, and it's not conducive to bringing things like the Limerick Soviet. I mean, to some extent, I wrote the book because, you know, I came to the conclusion in the early 70s when I was in the Labour History Society that no academic was going to write it, you know. Um, that that what, what is going on now is a process of find the most obscure woman or man or event that you can and do them to death in your MA thesis or your doctoral thesis and then get some publisher 
to turn it around into a hardback book and you know sell a few hundred copies of it or, 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 or something like that. And my plan, I thought to myself, look, I did the book in 89, I must bring it out to mark the centenary. And it proved to be a much bigger job than I thought, because all of these new archives, new information had been had been opened up, which wasn't uh, which wasn't available to me at, at, the, at the time. But as the decade of centenaries in the South be began to unroll, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting more concerned about it rather than less, is that the emphasis on it now is going to be very much, and I'll be careful in the words I use, I don't want to be disrespectful uh, to the memory of anybody, but it's going to be very much around ambushes, raids, assassinations, all of that end of things, without realizing that at the, that a mile from the crossroads where a particular ambush took place, we'd say, just for an example out of my head, there may well have been a mill or a creamery further down the road, which was occupied by workers in, in you know. And one of the one of the mistakes now that has been made in the in the South is that Typical enough thing. The central government said, oh, eventually they, they were persuaded we need to have a decade of centenaries. And then they said, okay, right, let's get the county councils involved. You know, let them come on. And the thing about the council officials is that they they don't have any politics, they don't have left politics. And my view is that they will hair up every crossroads and boring in pursuit of an ambush or uh, an action of some kind, and they will bypass the creamery or the mill or the farm that was seized by the workers and that was run by the workers or, or taken over. So I'm a bit concerned, and that's why I'm, I'm actually, from any, for no other reason, I'm glad I did the book now, and I'm glad I expanded it out, because I hope that it can be used as a leverage in the next few years of the, um, of the, of, the, of, the, of the commemoration to get people to understand that there was this wider dimension. I mean, I, I'll put it this way, I'll, I'll speak very frankly. 21st of January 1919, Robert Byrne, the man I mentioned, who was on hunger strike and who was killed in the hospital in Limerick and whose death sparked the Limerick Soviet immediately because, that, as I said, he was IRB, he was a unionist, he was everything. That started on the 21st of January. 1919, the same day that the first thaw in met in public, and the same day that the shots were fired at Sunhead Bay. Now, the commemoration of the first thaw, rightly so, supplements in the newspapers, the tea shop, ministers, TDs, everybody down in the round room of the mansion house. I went down to Sunhead Bay for the centenary, it was kind of part of my family lore, and you couldn't get near the village, you had to be shuttled in by buses because there were so many people there. So there was a couple of thousand on two separate days. And yet, you know, I kind of said to myself, the day we laid the reeds at Bobby Bourne's grave, it was two Sundays, and there was a particular Saturday as well in City Hall in Limerick. Like, there was no more than 50 or 60 people. Do you know what I mean? And I'm not being critical of anybody, but you have to kind of, you have to kind of ask, just ask yourself the question, for those of us involved today in politics, what does that say about what we prioritise or what we think was important in the struggle for independence uh, and in the struggle that went on in 1919 to 23? So to, 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 to come to, to your, your question, I mean, we're at such, we're at such a stage now I won't say we're so far back, that one of the one of the priorities, and you know, don't want to hark back to ours if you can need it, is that we do need to create we have good academics, such as uh, such, such as Hurley, but we do need to create a cadre, it seems to me, of younger people. When I say younger, I don't mean 19, 20, I mean in their twenties or in their thirties, or whoever. Some of whom maybe see. With all due respect, I think you might agree with some of what I can say. The danger when they go to, I mean, you have a situation down in Limerick, University of Limerick and Mary Immaculate College in Limerick, and they hardly bother with the movement. 
with the, with the Limerick Sausage in their history faculty. And the danger is if we say, let's get, a, let's get young people into the universities, into the history faculties, and let's get them studying labor history. They're just going to be, they're just going to be morphed into taking, you know, Mary Malarkey or Paddy Malarkey, who was some obscure uh, person in, I don't know, North Clare or County Monaghan, and do your thesis on that. And don't be bothering with things like militant socialist organisations and so on. So, and I, I suppose, to some extent, I'm an example of what I'm, what I'm preaching in the sense that, you know, I, I was an example of what you were talking about. Before. I came to Dublin, I had a good job, but in the evening time I went down to the National Library four or five days a week and I was able to spend the time doing the research. So I think to, to, to answer your question, the first step is to, is to start seeing can we get a cadre of people who are just going to uncover the knowledge of it and uncover it, as I said in my talk, warts and all. Uh, and to recognize that you know, some, some people were good at a certain time, they were challenged at another time, and maybe they weren't so good, and they went back to being good. And then as the knowledge comes out, I think from the greater knowledge comes the, the confidence which is generated, such as Fergal mentioned, by knowing that working people, and remember, the working people today are a hell of a lot more sophisticated and a hell of a lot better educated than the people of Limerick were in 1919. So, I think the first thing, the first job is to get young, get people organized and mobilized to take upon themselves the job of going to archives like the local newspapers and going, you know, page by page, week by week through them to find out the things that actually happened that are not mentioned in the books by the academics and that are even not mentioned in the Bureau of Military History archives that are available online now in, in Common Brewer Barracks. Okay. Um, well, can you make a link with the anarchist movement or anarcho-syndicalist movement? Yeah. I mean, uh, you didn't mention them in all the story. Uh, they were present or not present? Yeah, there is a, there is a link. Uh, at least my, my what I would say in response to, 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 to your question is that the key person in part in that response is to think about James Connolly, right? You know, we talk about Connolly being a, a socialist, a uh, trade union organizer, and so on. But as you'll see in, in, in RC Community, a very formative time in, in developing Connolly's thinking was when he was in the United States um, and became involved with the industrial workers of the world and came across the philosophy of syndicalism and indeed anarcho-syndicalism. And even in the United States, uh, at that time, there were, there were varying wings uh, of syndicalists and uh, anarcho-syndicalists. And much of what they were debating about was the tactics or the strategies that had been used, that had been used in France. So my response to you is that what, what Connolly, the, you know, if you, if you look across the writers, the thinkers who made distinctive contributions to, to, to the development of socialist thinking, okay, you think of Karl Marx, you think of Engels, Lenin, Stalin, Trotsky, Gramsci, whoever you want to, want to talk about. But I wanted to say, what did Connolly do? distinctively. It was that he brought home, in my view, he brought home to Ireland his understanding of syndicalism. The idea that workers would be organized into five or six large unions according to their occupations. Those unions would unite together at the top in what was called the one big union, the, the OBU, which used to be still in the, in the badge of the union here in Ireland. And that that would be the vehicle, ultimately through a series of general strikes, would be the vehicle through which the workers would take state power and which would ultimately become the, the method by which the state would, would be governed and so on. And here's the distinctive little twist that he added to it in Ireland, in that he, he, he pointed out that this syndicalist means of one big union 
and, and, of, um, and of a general strike could be the means that would be used to gain independence for Ireland. And somewhere, I don't have, I do have a copy of the book here, but somewhere in there, I found it, a quote from Connolly, where he says, if it comes, I'm speaking from memory now, he says, if it came to a test over independence between Britain and Ireland, what better asset could there be in the hands of Ireland or of Irish workers than control of the railways and the shipyards and the docks? In other words, he foresaw a situation at the time he wrote that, which I think was probably 1914, where this syndicalist, I won't say anarcho syndicalist, but this syndicalist approach could be used uh, basically to get, to get the British out of Ireland. Now, I have to put up a big, a big red flag here and say that eventually, <coughs> by the time we got to the beginning of, of 1916, by, once, once the Great War broke out, um, Connolly uh, obviously was one of the, the few socialists in, in Europe who saw it as an imperialist war and so on. But he was determined that you know England's difficulty would be Ireland's opportunity, and that at some stage during that, that there would be a rising against it. Uh, and eventually, as we know, in January of uh, 1916, <coughs> you could even say he went voluntarily or he was kidnapped. He spent three days ensconced with the leadership of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. He became, he was Commandant General uh, of the Irish Citizen Army and was given a major and important military position in the planning and in the execution of the Easter Rising of 1916. And if you were being critical of him, you could say, you could ask, let's, let's ask the question rather than make a direct proof. Say, did he, in fact, when it came down to it, abandon? his idea of using industrial means to gain Irish freedom for, if you like, the more conventional idea of an armed rebellion and a rising. I don't know. Uh, you, you, I think you could, you could raise that question about it. In one way, you can say it doesn't make a difference. Connolly was Connolly. He said what he said, and he did what he did, and he achieved what he did. But the, the, his presence in, in the GPO um, was kind of slightly at odds with some of what he had been saying, I think, in the years earlier on about the means. But, as I said, with people like John Dowling and, with, and indeed with William O'Brien, I think he was shrewd enough to know, um, you, know this, you know, these comments from Connolly that if you uh, take down the Union Jack and re replace it with a tricolour, and if you, uh, you know, paint the Post boxes green and so on, <coughs> and you do nothing, you know, if it's not done in a socialist Ireland and you unite, united Ireland, you would just unleash a carnival of, of reaction. I think he did, he was careful enough to make sure that there were people left behind as well who, who still believed in his syndicalist approach to things, and that was what we saw in the Limerick Soviet of 1919, and what we saw at the point where, if you like, the paths diverged, where the separatists of both kinds, the peaceful and the militant separatists in April 1919 said, you're on your own, we're not with you, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to use international pressure or we're going to use a guerrilla war, but as far as using um, trade union means, you're on your own. That meant that the workers who were adhered to a syndicalist view had to plough their own furrow, if you like, and inevitably, as I said at the top, it was a flawed kind of a model on which to be saying. Yeah, 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 it's interesting. It made me think about Otto Donald's thing and the Mansion House when Sinn Féin was uh, set up in 1917. Otto Donald said he was the Mansion House and the chair uh, sort of granted by Connie or Connie had achieved for labour within the national movement to let them so th it's one of the big problems, as Liam alluded to, is that when big decisions about how the settlement and the revolutionary settlement were going to be achieved and implemented, labour was absent. That it came, uh, and again, then that feeds into your other point about this divergence between a very syndicalist and quite revolutionary grassroots, and then elements within the leadership, particularly around Thomas Johnson and O'Brien, who were more content 
for an organization trade union movement and labor party on the British model as opposed to perhaps to the uh, uh, you know half a loaf of bread and no bread we have carved our niche out in this new state and we're going to hold on to our movement but what you get there then is you get the abandonment really of the revolutionary syndicalism of Connolly despite the fact that the you know one, like what was there two hundred thousand members there from the general yeah. labor union yeah. an awful large percentage and majority of these people are pledged towards revolutionary syndicalism are doing it or are out on the, on the ground doing it but not receiving the support from their national leadership and the national leadership itself is the way decision making and the establishment of the state because they've abstained really in many respects from the same union. Yeah. Do we have a question? Uh, well first of all thank you for an absolutely fascinating talk. And I would heard of the survey memory. We had absolutely no idea, no idea how widespread and how revolutionary uh, it, what it was. Um, one of the things I was interested in is you mentioned that uh, the term Soviet was used obviously to demonise that at a time uh, after the particularly after the um, yeah. A Bolshevik revolution that, that implied all sorts of things, and they embraced it. And I, my problem there is they've embraced the way that can be used against them, and uh, in that global context. So, if, my question is about if we're looking at a united island, and certainly one of the talks about the tender of being about the united island, and stressing very much it has to be something new, something that says everybody's something more progressive, etc. All, all the sentiments with, with which I would agree. But my question is just as if you're going to be painted as Bolshevik um, in the time of Soviet Limerick, that, that's going to unite a lot of people against you. How can, how can Ireland become progressive in a neoliberal world? Um, if, you know, if, if, uh, to incorporate Northern Ireland in the Republic, you're probably going to need a lot of support and finance from the European Union, which is a, neo, a neoliberal project. Uh, in the United States, which certainly doesn't want to be progressive or liberal. Um, so this, this, this is my question. What, what you're saying? Learn the lessons from what happened there. But is it not also suggesting a standard pessimism? Yeah, I, I, don't, I certainly don't want to be pessimistic about it. Uh, I suppose um, uh, what I'm, what I'm saying was that they're going to have. To you know, there are steps, right? And I think <coughs> your, your own point that you were aware of the Soviet, but you weren't aware of how widespread it was and so on. There is a, there is a big job to be done among uh, whatever number of people there are who aspire to a united Ireland, a, a united socialist Ireland, a, a united, even a united progressive Ireland, let's call it that, to, uh, uh, as I was saying earlier on, to first of all unearth this information, you know, to, 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 to I mean, I was down in Cork uh, there, there recently uh, speaking in the library, and people were amazed to discover that the, 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 the dockers in Cork took over the harbour in Cork in 1921 and ran up the red flag and ran it as commissioners for a week. And in other words, what I'm saying, and, and this is my point about the decade of centenaries in, in the south in particular is that there there are many examples in our in Irish history which have been covered over to now of very radical action by women and men under the banner under a red flag or red flag and tricolor and uh, under the banner of being organized trade unionists and so on and really I suppose I'm at this at the stage I, 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 as I say that sounds maybe a weak answer to you, is that the, a, an important, we won't galvanise people and we won't move people along the road until, as I, as I said, as I said in the introduction of the book again, we demonstrate to people that their grandmothers and their great-grandmothers, you know, were far more radical and far more advanced in their political thinking than we are today. And that, and that what we need to do is, I suppose, is learn from them, not in a practical sense necessarily, but be inspired by what they do, by what they did, and that it gives us the hope that if that 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 we can do something, something in our in our own time. But I think we're a long way uh, from developing a consciousness where you could be very prescriptive or specific, if you like, with particular actions um, that, that that would have been. Uh, 
uh, that would have been taken. But like, just even in terms of the United Ireland, it's very important. Uh, I don't know how it can be done, or it would take a long time, and you know, this is this is a difficult time to be doing it. But it's very important, I think, for for loyalist workers to understand that you know that this picture that they might have had in their minds of some kind of a green, white and orange thing that started in 1916, and they were all united together under this banner until all they split in 1921 over the treaty, and then they split the North off from the South, that it was far more textured and nuanced. And I suppose to just, that they, that they would perhaps begin to learn that within that, a very strong element within it was a distinctively autonomous uh, socialist attempt at building towards a workers' commonwealth by a man who had years of experience at the coal face here in Belfast. That's about as much as I No, no, really, I'm really admire your optimism. It's just that. Thank you, this, this, I mean, this Thank you for calling me an optimist. <laughs> it's just this. <laughs> <thing. Please. laughs> if, if you look at revolution no, after revolution, like revolution after revolution, there's always this question people unite around home rule. But then once they've got home rule, they divide over who's going to rule at home. And then the ones that come out on top seem to be almost the ones that come out on top. Then it's not those lower socioeconomic orders to use the, to use the jargon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and there's a whole, a whole range of reasons, but I, I guess I just look at the trends. I mean, you just have to look at England and look at the demonisation of some like Jeremy Corbyn. And if you look at his policies, they're actually quite moderate. And I would think that possibly yeah. the sorts of policies that people over here might feel we would want to implement. Uh, and you, you just have to look at the, 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 the reach of the reaction and the way working class people are manipulated yeah. um, uh, by the media and, and, and you know, wider context. And we, are, we are living in a, in a, in a very, very uh, important period yeah. where we're essentially dealing with, I'm going to get all theoretical about it, the, the political ramifications of an economic crisis from 2008. Yes. The, the European Union might not always be the neoliberal entity that it is now, but there's an internal pressures and tensions in the European Union. There are one large elements that have destroyed the traditional social democratic parties, have led to a resurgence of the populist right, but it's also led to a resurgence of a more genuine type of socialist and, and popular movement in a large, large parts of Europe. If you want to start to try and, and build the United Ireland, you need to insist on at least uh, the expansion of these individual right liberal rights. Which, is, which don't do any real economic harm, but are necessary rights, rights for women, rights for women who's right to choose, home, uh, rights for gay rights, etc. But you need to expand those towards economic rights and in the direction of some uh, very, very fundamental social democratic rights, which citizens in Europe enjoy. So that there's a healthcare system for United Ireland to find as pure, that there's proper public investment in infrastructure, and uh, public ownership of utilities and nationalisation, and things like that in Germany, where they have over representation on most of the major companies, as opposed to a social partnership which was reasonably good during the, the good times, but left the, the workers at the rough end of it after the economic crisis. And you have a company that's basically run in the 26 pound you vote, it's the most neoliberal company <laughs> in Europe, practically. So, that the, so if you're going to try and get support from Europe, you have to hold a mirror up to Europe and say, well, if it's good enough, for citizens in Germany, or if it's good enough for citizens in France, why is it not good enough for citizens in the United Ireland? And then, then and use work within the framework of the possible. Don't perhaps I think what you're you're saying there is you're not going to come out and, and raise a revolutionary banner and set up a communist state in Ireland. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I, I think just similar to what I heard the same. Look, looking back at, at the Democratic period, it's it's very it's very important. I mean, rank and file is important as well, but but it's important as well that that the leaders we choose, you know, are committed to the project as well. I think that's one of the, the tensions that was there uh, among the, the working class at the at the time of the Limerick Soviet and all through 1920, 21, 22, um, that um, William O'Brien, whom I mentioned, uh, I mean. I mean, he, William O'Brien's connection with James Connolly went back to the end of the 19th century. I mean, he was a, he was they were they were close comrades in the Socialist Party of Ireland, uh, the Irish Socialist Re Re Republican Party. And as it happens, O'Brien was himself a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. You know, but you know, once once 
Once Connolly had been executed and was out of the way, you know, O'Brien was not prepared to continue the kind of radical, syndicalist type leadership that had been shown and had been had been taught by by Connolly. Equally, uh, Thomas Johnson, uh, who we who we've mentioned, who I, I think was uh, correct me if I'm I think was originally was yes. from Lim from Liverpool and came through Belfast to working in uh, the, the retail trade in, 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 in Belfast. But I mean, Johnson couldn't wait for a parliament to be set up, you know? Once the Irish Free State, Doyle and Parliament was set up, he couldn't wait to get in there as the official opposition. So what I'm saying is, you know, you, you, you can have, you had, in terms of the movement at the time, up to the middle ranking organisers, people like John Dowling, Jack Headley, James Baird, all of that, men who were, there were no women unfortunately involved in it, men were able to, like, if you think of it in military terms, command a county, or maybe together command a province, but there were, but there were none of them at national level, and it is interesting what Fergie was saying, that when you think about it, the seven, uh, I'm not sure if it was Countess Martha who there or not, the seven people who sat around the table from the cabinet of the first Thawai to meet the trade union leaders to talk with the Limerick Soviet, including William O'Brien, I think I'm right in saying from memory, had all been uh, out in 1916 uh, in, in, in various parts of it, but, but, but there was nobody, because Connolly was gone, there was nobody sitting on the, um, the trade union side, if you like, that had that was able to, the only one that had anything near it was William O'Brien himself, that had the kind of moral weight or moral banner to be able to say, we can look you in the eye and we're not asking you, we're saying we're going to move forward uh, and we're going to extend Limerick out into a general strike or, or whatever. You know, so, yeah, the removal, Connolly's thought lived on, right up to the middle ranking, uh, parts of the of the trade union and the labour movement, but Connolly's leadership was gone once he was executed, and I think that was kind of a, a structural flaw that, that was like, one and more, nobody came forward. One more question, at least. Anybody else? Or, so, just sure, I'll take no image. I can see them. They're carefully. They're the boss of the board. I know. I'm the leader of the board.